Right, I can see that Brian is obviously the one who's causing the problem over there. If we can settle now, please, everyone, and if we can have our, our table back again. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do now is invite contributions, questions, comments, ringbacks, whatever. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have got a lot of stories to tell of your own. However, because we've got a lot of people here, uh, it's gone nine o'clock now, could I respectfully request that if you do want to say something, and I hope there'll be a forest of hands in a minute, uh, you try to restrict your comments and questions to one minute. Uh, and I'm going to ask if possibly, if, if we've got people here who are going to respond, if we can try to do the same. Uh, and in that, you know, in that way, we'll probably try to get as many people as possible in. Now, I'm going to apologise ahead of time as well. There are people here whose names I should know. There are one or two whose names I do know. But there are an awful lot of people whose names I don't know, even though you're, you're all known to one another. Uh, so I hope you, uh, if you'll accept my apology for talking about uh, the person over there or the person over there or whatever. Okay, right. So, uh, if we can actually move to questions. Who has got the first question? There will be someone. I, I, I know that, you know that people are still busy eating and I don't want actually people to have to start spitting food out. That would be a terrible shame. Uh, but uh, we certainly want to know about libraries and I know we've got a question about that. But first, we've got someone to kick us off. Thanks very much. Right, um, where are the um, Irish people actually from? Were they from the same area, or were they what? actually across the board? There was 400 of them, but I can't say every one of them. But some of them, my guess, was some of them were from Northern Ireland, but not yeah. all of them. The ones who I heard speak sounded like they're from maybe Liverpool. There's a, a few <laughs> Scottish actors there, from Corby. And, um, but Corby, is, isn't it like um, Little Scotland? It is, but Scotland has its own yeah, yeah. division, doesn't it, with its uh, uh, Protestant Catholic issues. Because what my experience of Belfast is with... Yeah. Um, very, what's been very amusing is when Scotland were in the bottom league of the uh, over there when they got relegated down to the bottom. I was in, I was yeah Rangers were there sorry I was in the I was in Belfast and there was a twenty foot picture of Lee McCulloch on the side of a house. And Lee McCulloch is a very very poor footballer. He played for Wigan I think before the Rangers. It was sort of remarkable to see this. You know, and I realised then you know, kind of. How deep the divisions are. Yeah. That, that somebody who was deep enough to wind up their neighbour by having a massive <laughs> picture of a ranger player was pretty crap. <laughs> <laughs> so going back even further, I'd imagine that was pretty. Yeah. I think I think there was more over the place. Certainly a lot of North Irish accents, a lot of uh, emigrants, I would say. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot, a lot of more than I Yeah. There was a lot. You don't get those fans over here so often, do you? When we got the major rats coming down the street, would it? Not sort of a... No, no. Rats, it? was a lot there. What, what were they playing, Dave? Well, I just say you saw it with. I was a flute. I mean, like Dave Manor, who I really would, hoped would, would be here. Um, and Glenn, um, who's actually... There's a photograph of Glenn um, with a banner. I've actually smashed the banner over the head of... Um, not uh, of, a, of, of a bandman. Um, but for me, the most scary part of that day were um, the musicians who suddenly um, stopped playing outside the cobblestones, turned 90 degrees, and so there about four flute players, an accordion player, and about five drummers. All of a sudden, stopped playing, turned 90 degrees, started playing again, took five steps forward. And they started bashing us about over the head with their flutes. <laughs> a lot of massive bruises on the shoulder. And so, like, you know, using musical instruments as assault weapons is pretty scary. It was a scary, it was a scary day. And, and like Brian hinted at, I think um, uh, to try and put it a little bit more graphically, when and, and there is a, an amazing photograph in the book of this: 400 Ulster Unionists from Liverpool and Glasgow, as well as Belfast. Marching down the Bristol Road, and Bristol Road mothers and some fathers were bringing their children out to see this colourful parade, and that's when the chance of "f off, you Fenian scum" came. <laughs> and that, that's what they were. That's what the Bristol mothers were, were met by. Was those chants, and they were 
pretty pissed by the time we got to Bridgewater. Yeah. It, yeah, was a scary, it was a really scary day. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether that's another tall tale of day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just struck by the fruits because I saw the first no, time I told it, it was a tailor. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, it'll be a trombone next time. Uh, right, so, so where can we go next? Okay. I, 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 I can see there's a, a whole plate full of food there as well, but I know there's a gentleman here who wants to ask a question about libraries in Wales. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, <laughs> Mick, you were saying uh, that uh, early, the early years of the last century, um, when they, they moved a lot of the old miners' libraries, working men's libraries actually, weren't they? Not just miners' libraries. Working men's libraries to Swansea. Now, do they still exist? Uh, are they still there? Mm -hmm. As far as I know, they are, because they, they went into the building belonging to Swansea University. And it's also lecture space and everything else that's there. Um, but part and parcel of the project was to preserve those libraries, that's why they were moved there, uh, simply because they were uh, going to lose them in some of the valleys where they came from. <coughs> Thank you. It's in a place called Uplands, if you ever go back to Swansea. Of course, one of the things we haven't mentioned, uh, of course, is that Dave has his own amazing archive uh, and uh, you know all of this in a sense comes from that uh, now of course you've moved some of your archive Dave uh, into the is it to the public records office now to the heritage center uh, Bristol University's got some but... so you know, there's quite a bit going on there I think you know all of us really want to support that as much as possible uh, I am reminded because I can see the poster in front of me here that, that we've got all these books here and it would be nice actually if, uh, if some of them could actually disappear tonight and if anybody actually wants to buy any of the prices is here as well so please uh, you know, be generous right uh, another question here um, so I brought my son my other son with me tonight he's 17 um, he's um, on the left so he's like the next chance how do you keep going and keep being inspired and keep the fire in your belly when the times are like they are now for the left. Who would like to pick that one up? Is that, is that straight for you, Claire, or not? Who'd like to take that one? Well, I don't think that's typical, isn't it? I mean, the youngsters are, it seems to me, the youngsters today are very enthusiastic about <coughs> the environment, green issues, and so on. And that should be perhaps what uh, the left is. Um, it is taking up more, uh, certainly Keir Starmer's party, anyway. Because uh, I, I think that might give him a better chance of, of election. Can, can, can I say what's most important to me? And this probably won't go down very well. I think you have to be angry. I mean, I, my, my sort of, and I'm not, you know, I'm not very good at anything, but. As a child, I can remember instance, I came from a you know, pretty hard at working class single parent family. And I was unlucky enough, and you know, Nick's talked about the comprehensive system. I was unlucky enough to go to a girls' grammar school, which I hated passionately, and I think they hated me, it was, you know, it was pretty even. And my experience of discrimination that I suffered, you know, not I mean, made me angry, made me feel a strong sense of, of, of the need for justice. And I think we have to keep that alive. I think anger is very, very important. And that sounds like violence. It's not, you know, yes, I'm quite violent. It's not. There's actually a picture of one of the things that they referred to. I mean, that, that I fancy the, the um, being in, I was one of the being in scum. <coughs> we were at a, a peace conference. <coughs> no, no, sorry. An anti-racist, um, anti-fascist conference in Exeter. And I was making a speech about the need for non-violence and how important it is to direct people. Mm -hmm. And he gets up and stands up with his front cover of the carrot, which has got me with this placard. <laughs> 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 so, so I'm a hypocrite. 
but I mean, I think, you have, I think anger rather than violence is really important. You should be angry about injustice. You should be angry about the fact that the rich get richer and we get poorer. And I think that's, that's what keeps people, um, I should be what keeps people. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? I think I think Sheila Hancock's got a book that's just come out, which yes, is called "Old right. Rage," yeah. isn't yeah. it? So, so this is something that should apply to all of us. <coughs> Dave, I think you wanted to come in. Again. Well, forget about the word socialism, which means you know fifty-seven things to fifty-seven different people. But every single person on the stock table, whatever their age, still believes in the basic things that we believed in when we were your age. You know, I, I became a bit of a rebel when, when I was when I was when I was your age, and um, I like to think I still am and we've just kept our beliefs. It's a, it's a mental thing. You believe in cooperation, you don't believe in competition, you believe in sharing, you believe in equality, you don't believe in, you know, oh, multi-millionaires, aren't they great people, don't they work really hard? You don't believe in any of that. Just believe in people working together for the good of everybody. And to, you know, with all our different shades of opinion on this top table, everybody still believes what they believe when they were 17. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But thank Christ there are people like you from along. Because like, sometimes I think, you know, where are the youngsters? I do think that sometimes. You see, every one of us here, if we can talk about a story of a totally different world, the 1980s, uh, you know, one of the horrible, oppressive Tory governments in been. We'll never see that again. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps that's the first lesson. Yeah. Just have a look at what's going on now. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. If that doesn't convince you to stay what you are, nothing will. <laughs> I know there's another question over here. Before. Well, it's it's really to add to the comments that have been made to the, the young man down there, is that I think we have to make space for young people, because what we can be is quite dominant, because we've got experience, we've got life, we've got ways of doing things, and I think we have to we have to be really careful that that doesn't become the dominant way of working and not create space for young people to come in with their own ideas. And, you know, it's a different world these days and I keep thinking, I don't know, maybe we just keep doing more of the same thing and maybe we need to do something different. And maybe these, these young people are the people who've got something different that might yeah. help us as well. Yeah, just sort of following on from that, it's deciding what your values are. You've got people around you are helping to shape that as well. But what becomes an important issue for you to take on and so forth? We've all had to change as well in terms of our thinking. Diversity and so forth has made us change in the way and we, what, how we spoke, the values that we have, and, and how we've changed over a period of time as well. So that's quite important. But you know, there will be things that you will pick up and take on. Uh, because you know you feel they're not right, yeah. and I think that's you know it's about considering those. You know, if it means something to you, then you'll follow it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more people here. So uh, Gemma, someone whose name I actually remember. Right, Gemma first. Um, can I add in on this conversation as a fellow like young person? I mean, I'm almost 22 now. I've been involved in the party for. Glenn, you've been stuck with me for almost five years now. <laughs> I'm sorry. It seems longer than that, Glenn. Well, you can, you can see I'm well liked. But, um, yeah, I said listen to them, but also keep your own mind, because there's, there's growing points coming up, there's things, the world's changing. Like, I don't agree with Glenn on everything, and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes. Well, you drink cider, how can you piss <laughs> at me? But also fight to be heard, because I find sometimes <coughs> this lot are amazing, but sometimes in other realms of political world, people seem to think that young people don't have a clue what they're on about. Yeah. And I found if you, if you keep fighting and you keep pushing your point, then eventually they will listen and they will take action about it, as you've seen, you know, with the. Um, climate change protests and stuff, led well by young people and stuff, so just keep fighting to be heard amongst people who think that we shouldn't have a voice. I'd like to make the point that the time that we were actually uh, referring to, we were all really quite young yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 
someone made the point to me a short while ago, actually, that, that between now, 2022, and 1970, when I was still quite young, there's the same distance in time between 1970 and 1918. Which is something to think about, isn't it? Pete? Yeah, uh, I'll just say to you, mate, question everything. Someone tells you something, don't take your face value. Look into it, look behind yeah. the statements. Yes. Yes. Even if it's whoever, whoever's in power. And and as well, I would say, uh, if you are questioning everything and, and you're listening to people who, who are in positions of power, what I've learned, certainly as far as my trade union work is concerned, is that most of the time they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so the big word is share. Sharing. Thank you. Right, yes. Yeah, my point is, I'm just wondering how much of the young people's opinions. How much of this is under the wire? And the reason I say that, because I've got two daughters who are 24 and 26, and I'm always astonished by some of the things they say, which are pretty, you know, how can I say it? They mirror my views, and it's the sort of thing that when you're a teenager, anything your mum says is naff, anything your mum does is crap, you know, etc. Suddenly, I'm hearing what I would call, you know, really socialist views, I'm hearing, you know, anti-racist views, I mean, all these things coming back at me, but they don't mobilise. They don't do anything about them. They don't pursue them. They don't, they're not politicised. You know, they discuss it, but they don't do anything. They don't take the next step. Meanwhile, my lodger has just finished a book about Clem Attlee, and he's citing him all over my house. So, you know, it's happening. It's out there. You know, it's just we're not seeing it yet. But I think it's there. I think it's bubbling up. And I'm just hoping they put their heads on the parapet and start standing for a little pencil. I'm working on my other lodger. He's a solicitor. He works with people um, who have difficulty, you know, mental capacity issues. You know, he works for Smartens, you know, and he would be ideal. And he's a socialist. I'm thinking, go on, stand for the council, you know. So I think we've got to do our bit in encouraging young people to, to mobilise and be part of this movement. Because, um, you know, that, that's our job. We really. hand over the baton, isn't it? Dave wants to come back in again. Thank you. I think everybody on the stock table has taken a risk, so you know they, they've taken a lead. So they hear something that's interesting that's going on in the rest of the country, and why is it happening here? And it won't happen. Nothing will ever happen unless somebody takes a risk and somebody takes a lead. Now I know you know there is some kind of a theory around that. You know, the people shouldn't have leaders. But Polly took a lead when she decided that there should have been a Somerset wing of the Star March. If Polly hadn't decided to do something, it wouldn't have happened. And that galvanised Glenn, it galvanised lot, and some men went on the Star March as well. It, was, it wasn't just women. Um, and one of the, it's not a theoretical question, but it's a serious question about history. And this is recent history. And, and what I'm excited about tonight is the possibility that because it's recent history, everybody's got a memory. That can, or most people have got a memory that connects with the stuff and the times I wrote back in the book. So it's about deciding that something so important that nobody else is doing anything, so I'm going to bloody well get a petition around my college. Or I'm going to bloody well get a placard and ask people to join me and see who else is interested. And, and one of the questions, which is, I think, a, a really serious question that I haven't got the answer to, is how many of these campaigns in Bridgewater that I chronicle in my book would have happened without people giving a lead, including everybody on the stop table and other people, yeah? Would those campaigns have happened at all? And actually, some, sometimes they would have and sometimes they wouldn't. Let me give you an example of a campaign which in some respects is the most memorable of all the campaigns, because it was local. And that was the campaign to make sure that Bridgewater people could have their babies in Bridgewater. Mm -hmm. The campaign to save the Mary Stanley Hospital. And it's documented in there, not fully enough, it deserves a little book of its own. But there are some absolutely brilliant photographs about the Mary Stanley campaign. Now that was led by, by people like us on the top table. Most of us had nothing to do with the health service. And what we were afraid of, because my belief is, and I think the last 40 years has proved this, that your average NHS campaign to save a ward or save a hospital starts off with massive enthusiasm and everybody's up for it, the workers, um, you know, the, the people who use health service and the general public, um, and maybe the political parties, and they had one glorious march. I, I could name 
sometimes they elect an independent MP. They have one glorious campaign, and sometimes the Tory MP gets invited along just to show that everybody's in favour. And, and this happened in Western Supermare, happened all over the place. Some Liberal Democrat, some Tory, some independent person, but whose heart really isn't in it, they're in it for themselves, head the campaign, lead a march of 5,000 people for a town, or in the case of Western Supermare, you have 20,000 people. 20,000 people. And then six months later, the ward is closed or the hospital is closed. Why? Because those people who lead the campaign haven't got their heart in it. They're in it for themselves. So you, you, the reason why babies are still being born in Bridgewater, it's not a big enough ward, and probably doctors still push mothers to be, expected mothers to go to Musgrove, but babies, so far as I know, are still being born in Bridgewater because a few of us set up the Mary Stanley campaign and we were not going to stop it for anything. We didn't care if the Tory MP didn't come on board. We didn't actually want them. We just wanted people, whether they're political or not, who wanted to save the Mary Stanley. And we went to any lengths. We were going to occupy the, the, the health trust. We had 30,000 people on the petition. We had 500 people march through this town. And we came within two votes of saving the Mary Stanley. Right? And, and Glenn's got a great story in there. One of the people who could have saved the Mary Stanley was the leader of the Tory party in the town at the time. We reckoned he was a real Bridgewater patriot, Trevor Donaldson, right? And he went to a bloody football match or something when he could have had the crucial vote to save the Mary Stanley, and that's on record. And we weren't prepared to take no for an answer, and we even had some, um, in conventional terms, quite unusual people speaking in the campaign, so we had a couple of Kent Miners. And our argument was, and these were very unpopular people, one of them had been jailed for four years for smacking a copper during a miners' strike. Now, a lot of people didn't like that. It didn't stop Bridgewater people marching behind us. And the reason why we wanted a miner was, who better to talk about the importance of the health service than a coal miner? Because every coal miner who's ever been down the pit for five years or more has seen his mate die in front of them through a coronary accident. And Trevor French, you know, rest, God rest his soul, it was absolutely brilliant. So, so, what I'm, so what I'm coming to is, take risks and give a lead. Don't take no for an answer. And that's why babies are still being born in Bridgewater, because of what we did in 1988. It's more of a comment, really, because I'm really interested in even thanking everybody, and I would know all of you, I don't know all the depth of that conversation. So, Pauline, I used to live in Hampshire and drive past Green and Common when I was going out, when I was about 18 and so on, <laughs> and see all those women. So that's one comment. The other thing that struck me as well, we mentioned the mental health crisis in 1989. That's the year I qualified as a mental health nurse. And the whole of my three years training was spent talking about how the big psychiatric hospitals were going to close down and all be community based. Um, so I've lived through that really interesting time to train. And then coming out and seeing actually, it was what was more important, I still believe this now, is the care. It didn't matter. They could have kept Tone Bay, they could have kept men in the hospital. What was really important was actually the care. Mm. and putting people into small little units mm. at the time. I mean, I, when I moved to Bridgewater in the 90s, um, I worked at Mendit Hospital before it closed down, we moved to a small unit, which is now gone at West Hampstead Villa, because the funding was pulled. It's all political, <laughs> of course. Yes. And those patients, I believe, are, are in the kind of, um, in Bridgewater, in one of the units there, the people I would have cared for then. So, yeah, it's really interesting to hear, you know, those, the mental health crisis in 1989 when I qualified, we're still talking about it 30 years later. Mm -hmm. And I've worked through the mental health service all through that time as well. Right, does anybody else have a comment? Right, yeah. uh, I, I'm just going to pick up the, the notion of, of, of health again. Oh yes, sorry. Do, do you think nowadays that people are more happy to, to moan on social media rather yes. than actually get up and do something about it? It's easier to be a keyboard warrior and say this isn't right, that isn't right, and get people to agree with you on the comments, but to actually get out and do something about it is very different. Glenn. Yeah, I, the, that's exactly the thing I wanted to raise, but I thought I'm going to be accused of being an old fart who doesn't want to use mobile phones and that, but I, wow. I'm actually becoming a bit of a conspiracy theorist. I think it started with television, and I think technology is not really about making us happier and making yeah. life. I think it's, I think there's something else, and I think the alienation that people feel, you know, the fact that, I was saying to someone today, that there was a report a couple of years ago that more and more children were going to school unable to talk. Mm -hmm. 
so they're not their parents aren't conversing with them. I mean, I've sat in places, you know, in cafes with parents, and they've got little kids, and they don't talk to them, and I'm the only one talking to them because they're on their mobile phones. So I don't. I mean, I know that sounds like an old fart, you know, but I'm not really. I'm actually putting it from the point of view of I think technology is quite dangerous, and I think yeah. it is manipulative. And I think there is probably something in, in the idea that that is being used to stop us working together, thinking yeah, together, just cooperating, control. and sharing, and it's about control. And I, I, yes. I'm more and more convinced of that. Yes. But it does sound a bit kind of conspiracy yes. theory, so you have to watch it. Say. <laughs> People think we're like, you know, weird. I would really disagree with that, because I think that you, I mean, I don't really do that much, right? I have a child is disabled, so I, I can't work anymore. But um, I still post on my Facebook every day a few things that I know is going to piss off my Tory friends and things like that. <laughs> and it's a steady trickle of, you know, and things I think people should should know about or expose things. And also for organisation, like, you can reach a lot more people online. Like Bristol, we just had the Bristol Transformed Festival, which is like a two-day event, community-led, like with talks and things like that. And loads of people came from outside of Bristol to come to Bristol to, to attend that. And so I think, like, even though I can't do that much, although getting back into things now, COVID is not on, I can just keep drip, dripping things every day. One of my friends might think, oh, you know, that's, this isn't right. And get inspired themselves to change or their view or to do something. So I think there's a place for both. But I do agree, it's easy to make comments online. Not quite a good graft, you know. But I think at the moment that's really all I can do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, you mentioned uh, when you were on to in that uh, there was an unofficial strike somewhere. Uh, you didn't say what it was. And I have to admit, I haven't brought me in Morning Star recently, so I don't know. Well, it's not in there. Oh. Well, why, why, what, what is it in there? Where is it? Because I don't, I'd like to know. On that. April the 1st and, and April the 2nd, between 2,500 and 3,780 point C workers who were pissed off with their bonus going down every month and a lot of other issues, um, some to do with their accommodation, decided to walk off the job and, and occupy the canteen. Canteen takings actually went down because all the admin staff uh, couldn't get into their lunch. So they were all the, the stroppy steel directors occupying the canteen. And uh, the management, um, uh, the, the Lang O'Rourke, remember Lang's? Like one of the yeah. big British construction companies going back yeah. 80 years. Lang O'Rourke, the, the, the acronym is Bible, and they're the main contractor. And I haven't found an 80-point C worker who has anything good to say for them. First of all, they got 50 buses, those white buses, got 50 buses lined up outside the entrance of 80-point C and then told all the workers in the canteen, by, by megaphone or whatever, that unless they got on the bus and went back, they were deemed to have dismissed themselves. And not one man, and mostly, mostly they are men, but some women as well, went on that bus. And then they started to negotiate with the, with the unions and even some non-union people who suddenly declared themselves leaders. It was all a bit chaotic. And over the next 48 hours, basically, Bible gave in and gave them everything they wanted, apart from one thing, which is, we'll give you a, a decent bonus guarantee, we'll give you X, we'll give you Y, we'll give you Z. But every single one of you has been naughty boys and girls. You've broken the law. You've walked out without a ballot. You've walked out without giving notice of strike action. You've been naughty boys and girls. You'll all get a final written warning. So the sitting continued. <laughs> Until Sunday, when they said, OK, they forget about the final written warning. We go back to work. And because it was unofficial, and because it was illegal, and because the trade unions are very, very wary of getting sued, or seeming to support illegal action, it wasn't in any newspapers at all. And that happened on our doorstep, and that's yeah. the most serious unofficial strike in Britain for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only British people who know, people who know English mm -hmm. policy that, that, that know about it. Just on, just on the thing about social media, uh, Sue, I think, I, think, I think both yourself and, and uh, friend in the front 
Oh, right. Um, yeah, it's got negative. Well, I think out of a lot of people just... There's always been moaning minis, and somehow social media gives them the field day. They're, they're in seventh heaven, aren't they? Because they can moan to everybody. But also, as I think maybe you imply, maybe the quickest way to organise a demonstration is, is on Facebook, you know. So I think you're both right, really. Yeah, used correctly, it can be used in a positive way, but you, you have got a lot of people that just like to... Yeah, well, we've got a lot of real people yeah. in. Yeah. And we've got them in Bridgewater, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not many years tonight, though. Yeah. Right. Uh, can I make a comment on social media? Well, can I come back, back to Andy first, and then I'll come straight back to you? Well, we're <laughs> okay. Bye, Bye, Bye. Cheers. Just on social media, I mean, I use it quite a lot. Um, at the beginning of lockdown, I, a friend of mine sent me a letter that she'd received from her GP telling her that if she was to become ill and go into hospital, they wouldn't resuscitate her. These do not resuscitate orders. So I posted it on my Twitter account. I mean, I do have 40,000 followers, so it's, you know, I do have, I can reach quite a few people. Um, it, within two days, it was on ITV News. Uh, Within the week, it was being talked about by charities. And it, um, within a month, um, GPs had said that they, they, they wouldn't send those letters anymore. You know, so there, it does have, you know, if, if you can say the right things, reach the right people, it can have a real impact. It's the case, isn't it, that, that most large companies now have, have <coughs> digital marketing managers because they know how effective social media is for getting a message across. I think some of us just need to recognise that we ought to be doing the same sort of thing and, and, and thinking in the same strategic way, perhaps. Yes, I'm awfully sorry, I don't know you know. No, it's no worries. I just wanted to ask, really, um, the panel, what they think, what made Margaret Thatcher able to break the miners when it came to their, their strikes and protests? Because Ted Heath had all his Salesman policies that he ultimately you turned on. Uh, you had Wilson and you had Wilson and Callaghan with the Place of Strife report, which was a massive failure, and ultimately the, the workers and the miners kept on winning. But I just I, I'm not sure why it sort of came to a halt. Was it just because Thatcher was so ruthless and just cold hearted and didn't care? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get about uh, five or six different. Uh, views on that here. Uh, do you want to start us off there? My personal opinion, um, my friend, is that Thatcher didn't win the minor strike. The, the trade union movement and the Labour Party lost it yeah, yeah, yeah. by not walking out. I mean, sometimes, even if you don't like somebody like Arthur Scarga, for example, you've got to understand the basic issue there. They were fighting for their communities. It wasn't Scarga's strike, actually. He was just doing what the young miners wanted. They wanted a future in the mining industry. They wanted a, you know, for all its risks, they wanted a decent future, didn't they? So, yeah. really, it was up to the leaders of the Labour Party and the trade union movement to get everybody out on the streets. And, yeah. and with very, very few exceptions, for example, Jim Slater, the leader of the National Union of Seamen, was arrested <coughs> for going on board a ship in, in Newcastle that was carrying coal to Holland and ordering his crew not to sail. And he was arrested and chucked in jail. There are stories about the miners' strike which show how close mm -hmm. the people of this country came to victory in spite of the fact that the leadership of the Labour Party and the CBC didn't want to know. Uh, I have a personal memory, which is a mass meeting of a very angry Bristol postman and women, and um, we were arguing in the middle of the miners' strike for a decent pay rise. The 500 people in what is now Tony Ben House, the Transport General Workers Union place, and very, very angry. And um, all of a sudden, they offered, they offered the, the postman and women another 5%. And it was obvious why. Anybody who had half a brain and wanted to see, to see why the postmen and women would have been off another 5%. To buy us off, so all the postmen and women would be on strike. Bear in mind that we delivered to every house in the country. So unlike the National Union Mine Workers, everybody knows their postmen and women, and still does, right? That's, that's unique, almost. And, and I was the only one out of 500 people to stand up and argue against that massive rise that had been offered, because everybody else was so narrowly thinking, oh, oh great, you know, I'm going to have the biggest pay rise, I'm going to my missus, and we're going to have a, a second holiday this year. They no, turn it down. Turn it down and say, we will accept the pay rise when, when you give the miners what they want. And I was howled down. In fact, one lad from Arctic Fretman to smack me one because I was stopping his family getting the biggest ever pay rise. That's the sort of stuff that went on. So the, Thatcher did not, you know, this thing about the invincibility of the Iron Queen, it's nonsense. Our own movement let us down. And that's a fact. 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask Brian to come in next, and then I'll uh, come over to you, Cleo, if that's all right. Brian. I think what you said about Thatcher was right. She was all those things. But don't forget, Thatcher was there because of the failing to Tory terms of the Heath government. Heath, um, Heath did the daft thing of, of, of believing after people who runs this country, them or or us, and people said, well, not you, mate, he did that. And they, they said, and they, they, they won it at the ballot box, and they said, by the time we got to that, to the Labour Party was hopelessly divided by the Social Democrats, split at the time, and, and, and by weak leadership that was afraid to take, to take their proper role in industrial disputes. Uh, and the Tories were better prepared. The Tories had, had a go at the steel workers before him, and, and, and as soon as the miners uh, we're, we're down there to go the, the print workers as well, which we also sent people up to support that, that strike up there. Um, the Labour, Labour and the, 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 the Trade Union movement was at a quite low ebb and a very nervous of its capacity to unite and fight and shouldn't have been, but that's, that's a trepidation they felt. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah. yeah, I remember during the miners' strike there, I was in Plymouth. And we invited miners down and everything. We started, and it was actually working like the young socialists of the Labour Party made it happen. And there was a welcoming from the unions for it, and miners came down. And I remember in the first week, people like pensioners coming into that place, and literally taking out these poor, poor people, <coughs> taking out their savings and donating them to the miners. And I remember where I worked, the it was a, it was, it was health service. We're all unionised and that, but to be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, generally speaking, I feel like I was fighting in the lunch place. We have political discussion or anything, and I know that some of the women, it was all women in the office, had probably voted for Thatcher a, a few years earlier. But when that started, that strike, I can remember one of them saying to me, and the others all nodding in agreement, saying, "Well, someone had to do it. Someone had to stand up. This is the one. This is the one. You know, this is it." And so that was the mood, and I remember, to me, Starmer, <coughs> now, I, I mean, I'm not in the Labour Party, but to me, Mr Starmer reminds me of Kinnock, who had a much more radical profile, Do you allegedly. Mean, sir? Do you mean, sir? Yes. Yeah, is it Sir Kinnock and <laughs> Sir Starmer? I don't know. But hearing what you said about the poll tax, reminding us about that, about, uh, about that misjudgment. And for me, when he stood up in, in the House of Commons and condemned the violence of the pickets, that was when, for me, that was like, you've just blown it now, you've thrown it away. Because you should just be defending their every minor, up to, you know, absolutely unconditionally. And it was, and what I wanted to say was, this thing, this failure of the union of the Labour Party then, or the Labour government, or Labour opposition, is like, a lot of the time, I think trade unions, are very wise because they have a long game, you know, you've got a long game, and so when there's a, a down and people aren't very active and they're quite, you know, like we've been through a period like that maybe, then you get used to playing safe with the members and not alienating the public and all that. And the politicians too go, oh, we lost elections, maybe we'll be. But you're kind of listening to the wrong people and you've got to stay attentive to the, the mood because these things flare up like the poll tax did. These things come up and then there's suddenly an opportunity. It's not about what someone thought yesterday or what they voted. Suddenly everyone's feeling like this is a fight we've got to win. And that's the point where those people who've got the, the, you know, the trade unions and that need to be... And I don't blame people for getting kind of used to their position and, and knowing how to play it safe. But there comes, there comes moments like that where I agree with Dave. If they had actually literally you know, gone out and campaigned <coughs> in the rank and file of their unions to come out and support and said bugger the laws, bugger anything like that, then the miners could have won. Yeah. But, well, except that, you know, there were so many parallels, and I didn't mention the miners' yeah. strike, but... In, in, during, the, during the poll tax years, in 1989, I think it was, May 1989, district elections in England and Wales, the Tories lost 300 seats to Labour, because the passion in the country was aroused. Now, you think about 2017, Jeremy Corbyn, Biggest vote that Labour received since war. The response to that wasn't, yes, let's yeah. get on it, let's go. The response was, oh, 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 we can't have this. Yeah. Because this might, and you know, I'm sorry, I know I'm a member of the Labour Party, but highly critical, and I reserve that right, even if I get suspended. But I mean, I think, I think the Labour Party is much more concerned with appearing to be respectable, supporting the capitalist system than it is in fighting the Tories. And that's the problem that's got to be solved, it's got to be sorted in everybody. 
I bet Brian will disagree with me, perhaps, <laughs> and tell me where I'm going wrong, but I think, I think it's a huge issue for working class people that the Labour Party has not fulfilled its early promise, and you know, people have been fighting to make it for years and years, but we haven't got there yet. I, I know Dave wants to come back, but if you don't mind Dave, I'm just going to bring John in for a moment first, uh, to add to this, and then you come back after that. Uh, and what time, Dave, uh, are we due to finish? When, when people start to leave on mass, I suppose. Right, okay. <laughs> 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 midnight, when the bar shuts. Okay, <laughs> well, I might at some point leave you to it. Yeah. Right, uh, John. Yeah, I think the crucial thing about this is what we see in Bridgewater and what you've described, all of you, is real opposition, not Her Majesty's opposition. Mm. That's what we've got to grasp, is real opposition, the people, mm. as opposed to people who actually pretend <laughs> to yeah. Yeah. be with us and aren't. And, and that's just <coughs> being quick on our feet in our, in our thinking. Mm. And one of the, I think, it's a difficult thing to grasp, but I think the background to the defeats in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and, and even right through to now, is the big, big economic thing of actually our exchange rate being so high, um, all the time imports being used as a means of attacking the working class and the jobs that we have, and, and, and the production that we make. And that's, that big picture is very hard for us to grasp, but it's, it's only when we, when we understand these things do we, do we develop a real opposition. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring David first, and then I'll come to you, Mick. Yeah? Okay. I mean, I, I personally think it would be a shame if we got bogged down in just sort of, sort of one historical issue, but you know, Brian, you made the point, um, I think, that nobody on this top table was born in Bridgewater. Is that right? Well, you know, I mentioned the Mary Stanley campaign, and I want to mention another campaign that certainly was, in terms of what I was talking about, about leadership, uh, a working class, original born and bred woman who's here, Marilyn Markle, okay, because single handed, Marilyn <coughs> was a council chairman, <coughs> decided in about, I don't know, 2003, 2004, they wanted to privatise all the council houses. And up and down the country, they were selling off. The council houses. They were selling off to individuals from Thatcher's time, but this time they want to sell off the whole lot. Or, in the case of Bridgewater, because they had a substantial minority Labour group that was led by a guy called John Turner, who persuaded the Labour group um, to start with the Labour group with John Turner were in favour of Marilyn's campaign to stop the sale of council houses on the lot. But then they went for a compromise into an <coughs> arms length management organisation, Sedgemore Housing Association Limited, which is still there. And out of all the council tenants in the whole of Sedgemore, which goes right up to Cheddar, only one tenant decided that enough was enough and she won't have it. And she's in this room, Marilyn, right? And the trade union council, which has called this meeting, decided to give all the support we can. And we really hoped really hoped that the Labour Party would come behind us, but because of the you know, particular makeup of the leader or, or whatever, and I don't want to go into that, they decided to go for this halfway house, which is where we still are. And yes, that's better than out outright privatisation, as no doubt Brian and others in the Labour Party would argue. But one person wasn't going to have any of that crap and wanted to have a campaign to see if the people of Sedgemore, the council tenants, would fight to save the council houses. And I've got, I've got memories Marilyn's never been known for having E-type Jags or, 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 or posh cars. And, and I remember some very, very um, uncomfortable uh, journeys to the back of beyond in, in Sedgemore at the dead of night sometimes. Because we did our own ballot. So Marilyn just didn't campaign uh, by this time against like the Labour Party and the Conservatives around Sedgemore. She wanted to give their own ballot so that, so that Sedgemore would know that... Um, you know, the tenants were behind us, and, and didn't we, Marilyn? We just went, we knocked on every single carriage house door in, in this area. Every little villages, I'm yeah, yeah. Somerset born and bred, little villages I've never flipping heard of. <laughs> and you could tell the council tenants, couldn't you, Marilyn? Because they were mostly better maintained than the private ones. They just had new roofs or whatever. So we banged on doors. Marilyn did her own ballot, and 70% <coughs> of council tenants responded to Marilyn Markle's ballot. And by about 90% said, no, we actually want to keep council housing 
you know, crowd size, and we don't understand this Almo thing. Um, and you know, we, we campaign and campaign and campaign, uh, and in the end, and in the end, because of the influence of the person I've mentioned, and the fact that we didn't have the overwhelming backing um, of the Labour councillors, the, the, the council houses and campaign fell. But what, I'm only saying that because I wanted to mention Marilyn, like I mentioned the Mary Stanley campaign, and Brian did say none of us are born and bred in Bridgewater, but you can't tell me that if Bridgewater men, and maybe in particular Bridgewater women, decide to take this stand, they can move heaven and earth. And Marilyn Markle's an example of that. Mick was, was going to say something a moment ago, but if you don't mind it, I know that Brian wants to very quickly respond to something that Dave said, but oh, uh, okay. let's not become too factional about it. Well, I need to say that <laughs> to tell the story about he needs to remember that myself and Jim Mum didn't vote that way. We voted in favour of that. So okay. Jim Mum died last year. He's not here to say that himself. So, right? so, I need to remember that. Sorry. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. John Turner is the key. Mick. Well, I'm just coming back to your point about this. Sort of, uh, you, you, we can't underestimate the mobilisation against the, the miners at the time. And, uh, I, you know, I remember talking to some policemen who explained to me how much money they got during the miners' campaign because they were bust everywhere in order to actually work against Sorry, mate, can you speak up a bit? Sorry. Um, so it's that mobilisation that we can't underestimate that. Um, if you go down sort of valleys, it's, it is quite sort of, when you see them, they're just isolated now and poor yeah. Would we have a different view now about coal than we do then, you know? And I, and I think, you know, the whole thing about climate change and everything else, the issues that you talk about, and the way that we talk about energy in the future is changing our need for coal and perhaps what we should have been thinking about as well in the future. The Labour government was about how you actually renew these places that are run down. Renew them. Their legacy of those, I can, I was born in Bridgend and my valley that I came from was Blangarrow. They've got coal tips everywhere. The legacy of that industry is huge for the, for the Welsh government at the moment, the Welsh Assembly. Uh, but if you see it, you know, that you, you can see small communities around one particular industry and the way that they could be damaged very quickly by the mobilisation against them at the time. But I think over history and everything else, we would have seen a change to coal mining anyway. You, you've mentioned history there, haven't you? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to... Can I let... This gentleman come back first of all, and, and then I think we're going to call a halt to to this set of the proceedings. But obviously, there's still food to be eaten. There's a bar that's open, uh, so I'm sure a lot of people will want to stay here. Uh, yes, yeah, please. I just really agree with that. I feel like it's been a complete like, lack of leadership and complete failure to really mobilise the north of England, especially in, in Wales, to turn those mines into green renewable sources of energy and just anything, because it's now it's it's, it's just Desolate. It's destitute. There's nothing there. When I, when I went up around this year watching football games up in the north, I'd never really been up in the north, so I didn't really know what it looked like. And it, it, I really, really opened my eyes to see just the factories laying barren, windows smashed up, just nothing being utilised, just a complete waste of space. So I feel like it really is so important. I know the, the government talk of levelling up, um, but I feel like it's just it's so clear to see what needs to be done there just needs to be investment into it and, and trust in in people because those are people in places like Sunderland uh, and in the northeast that need jobs and they want to they want to carry on what how they used to work but they can they can still do that but just with these new green jobs that get that are well paid and like actually safe not like in the mines so thank you very much You will be pleased to know that, that, that Dave and I uh, are, are going up in three or four weeks' time. Uh, perhaps it's a little bit longer than that, but on, on the 9th of July. Perhaps we'll take one of the banners, Dave. 
that's all right, to the Durham Miners Gala. Oh. Uh, and, and there is still a, 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 an amazing legacy there and, and an awareness of history, you know, and if one day we could actually take a, a little bus full of people from Bridgewater up to that, I, I think I'd be really, uh, really pleased. Can I just add one thing uh, on my part as well? Uh, I, I work with a, a lot of young people um, and I find that an awful lot of them are very cowed by the idea of, of failure. Mm. And, and one of the things that we always try to teach people in schools and in college as well is that it, there is nothing wrong with failing more than once and failing better each time because eventually you'll get there. All right? But it's, you shouldn't be afraid at all of having a go and getting it wrong but then coming back for another go. And, I, and I'm quite sure by the sound of it, you've obviously got an awful lot of historical knowledge, much better than I have in some cases, uh, that you'll definitely get there. So thanks very much for your question as well. I've got something to say, is nuclear power all that? Check it. Uh, you'll have to say it again, I'm afraid. So I didn't understand what you were saying. Is nuclear power all that? All that. Is nuclear power all that? Um, yeah, I, is I, nuclear power like all that it's made out? Yeah. Is it right. as good or no, clean and efficient? We're living it now. Right. We're living here now. Dave, you started something now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I'm awfully sorry, but I think we. I, I said I was going to finish now. But on that note, uh, I'd like everybody here to actually rush over to that gentleman, all right, and start giving me their opinions okay. on it because it sounds like a really interesting debate starting up. Talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, everyone. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, on that note, that will probably be the the, uh, the theme of our next meeting in ten years' time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.